Hello, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Caesar. Uh, I'm from Bangladesh. So I work for the NGO called Creative Conservation Alliance, or CCA. Uh, we work with turtles and tortoises in Bangladesh, and we also work with uh, different other species like pangolins, uh, Burmese pythons. We also do a lot of community-based conservation work. We do believe in uh, hands-on, uh, boots-on-the-ground conservation work. So uh, today I'll give you an overview of our current conservation projects involving turtles in, in Bangladesh. So uh, to give you an overview mm -hmm. of the turtles in Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh uh, has a very high diversity of turtles and tortoises. Uh, we f fall within the lower Gangetic Plain turtle priority area and uh, eastern side of Bangladesh, which is a mixed mm -hmm. evergreen hilly areas, falls within the Indo-Burma biodiversity hotspot. To date, 25 species of turtles, uh, freshwater turtles and tortoises have been recorded and 21 of them are uh, globally threatened. And the species, uh, the triconid hill turtle, or the Melanocalis triconata, which is found in the uh, Terai region of Nepal and India, is recorded from Bangladesh, but we believe that is probably a uh, misidentification and uh, possibly uh, Melanocalis triconata uh, doesn't occur in Bangladesh and we haven't had any recent record. And the other species, Morenia ocelata, the Burmese eye turtle possibly occur in Bangladesh. We found a shell in a market a couple of years back and we believe uh, probably coming from within the country population. So we know very little on the turtle and tortoises in Bangladesh. Uh, there is a very, there are some historical uh, published information on turtle trade and some basic uh, nesting ecology of some of the common species. But other than that, we have very little information. And our organization CCA has been working on uh, five species of turtles. And there is another group from uh, Vienna Zoo led by Dr. Peter Prishak and also in collaboration with Bangladesh Forest Department and uh, Nature and Life Foundation Bangladesh. They've been working on the Bartagur Baska conservation breeding program. So we work, our focus uh, area is in the Southeast of Bangladesh, you see in the red circle. And on the center, uh, that's our turtle conservation center. Uh, that's near Dhaka. But in the Southeast of Bangladesh, we have been working for the last 10 years. Uh, and it's uh, culturally and geographically resemble more in uh, northeastern India and Myanmar. And it's part of the Indo-Burma biodiversity hotspot. And it's not been very, inhospi not very hospitable for uh, research and scientists because of its restricted area and also a very remote uh, rugged terrain. So there hasn't been done a lot of work until we ventured to that area in around uh, a decade ago and we have discovered so many species and we found over 32 uh, globally threatened species uh, including the large mammal like elephants, uh, uh, cloudy leopards and big cats. And uh, there are eight species of turtles have been recorded from Bangladesh, uh, from that uh, Chittagong Hill Tracks area. So five, four of them are critical endangered. Here are some pictures on the left is the critical endangered Manuriamis, Asian giant tortoise and on the right is Husamias depressa, that species that was thought to be only endemic to Myanmar, Western Myanmar, until we discovered the new population in 2014. And also on the left bottom is uh, the critical endangered Kura Mahuti. Uh, we also uh, discovered this uh, species for the first time in Bangladesh. And then uh, we have uh, Pangshura silatensis called the silat roof turtle. And the critical endangered uh, in the Testu de Longata as well. We also have uh, the soft shell, the Amidon Nata, and uh, the other box turtle, the Kura Ambenensis, and also uh, the Lysamis Pangchata are found mostly in the uh, urban areas in the ponds. And here are some pictures. So this on the left, there's some amazing forest that's some of the last remaining uh, primary mixed evergreen forest left in Bangladesh. And as you can see on the right side, be a lot of destruction, lot of, lots of logging, uh, encroachment, uh, new developments by roads by the government and also uh, slash and burn hasn't been very sustainable. As you keep, see on the top on the bottom right is uh, the, a picture of some uh, sh a shell of uh, Arakan forest turtles. Hunting has been a issue for, uh, for turtles and tortoises in that region as well. So what we have been doing for the last uh, five to six years, we have been working with the local communities to support uh, them, to motivate them for conservation. 
And uh, many of the uh, indigenous tribes, such as the Mro, uh, they are uh, very much in tune with nature, and they had they have some uh, traditional rituals and beliefs, such as the uh, the practicing of the community forest that they used to do. But unfortunately, as uh, everything is changing and the population hasn't been increasing, the uh, the practice of community uh, protected forest has uh, been eroding. Has been eroding. So we have been working with 10 villages. We have been motivating them to helping them to manage like 10 community managed forest. And one of our programs is Schools for Conservation, which basically uh, provides free education uh, service uh, for their indigenous kids because the area is extremely remote and uh, most of them don't get, have a school government school facility anywhere. So uh, that's kind of supporting them and uh, offsetting the cost of conservation. And so far every year we provide education for about more than 100 students from 10 villages in remote areas. And we also support other livelihood options such as we have some craft, craft program. We also uh, provide them with like uh, sustainable agriculture like uh, uh, slash and mulch. And, um, and we also have a parabiologist program which employs former hunter as a parabiologist and those people become the ambassador for conservation. So as you can see in the last uh, slides, they've been, uh, the larger areas have been destroyed, but we believe if we work closely with the communities, uh, we can uh, protect the smaller patches and, and uh, those uh, smaller community man patches of community managed forest can provide uh, suitable habitat for uh, turtles and tortoises. So here is a satellite image of some of our results. Like uh, on the left is a set picture of one of our community forests taken in 2015. On the right side, taken, uh, taken earlier this year. So you can see uh, the difference between the pre-intervention and post-intervention. It clearly shows some uh, the forests are re regenerating. We have motivated these communities to really uh, demarcated certain areas and uh, help them grow forests. So this only, this not only helping the biodiversity as well as also ensuring the water security of those people because water crisis has been a severe in the recent years. So uh, we also have this parabiologist program. On the left side, you see uh, on the top, uh, Mangin, on, one of our parabiologists, he has been uh, working for us for the last six years. and. So parabiologists like Mangin, uh, they visit those areas and they uh, try to rescue individual of turtles and tortoises, which are captured by the local hunters for primarily for consumption. So for the last few years, we have rescued and released about 130 uh, critically endangered uh, species of turtles and tortoises. Uh, and we estimating roughly about uh, uh, one four to uh, about 25 percent to 50 percent of the hunting decline in, in that area because the people are agreeing to uh, cease consumption uh, because they're getting direct benefit from our program like the school for conservation and obviously not everyone do adhere to the guidelines but we believe that the the, the species men's captured are are evidence that uh, they're giving up hunting and and, and that's kind of shows some the success and unfortunately, some of the species like the, the Manaria emis, Asian giant tortoise and the Arakan forest turtle have been found in such extreme low density. Therefore, if we want to recover their wild population, we have to uh, uh, get into captive breeding and, and, and ultimately release the offsprings to reinforce their population and help them for population recovery. So that how our uh, turtle conservation center was uh, born that established in 2017 uh, in 40 kilometers north of the capital Dhaka. Uh, we are conducting this project in support with Bangladesh Forest Department and several other donors. So the ultimate vision of our conservation breeding center is uh, to uh, increase the numbers in captivity and eventually release them in the wild to recover their oil population. So we have four species of uh, turtles and tortoises in our center. Uh, we have uh, five, eight individuals of uh, the Manuria emis, uh, five females and three, uh, three males. We also have some individuals of Hisamis depressa, Kuramhoti, and in the Studelangota. 
and we're hoping that we'd be able to transfer some of the rescued uh, individuals back to our center so they, they can contribute to for conservation breeding. So for the last three years, since our establishment in, was started, we have been focusing mostly on the captive breeding of the, uh, the Manuria emis. Um, so this is a picture of our center, basically housing facility for our um, our staff. Uh, two, we have two full-time staff and we have managers and we have volunteers helping us uh, to run the center. And, um, and here's our, uh, one of the enclosure we have, uh, because uh, the area is in, in a dry deciduous forest, so we have to ensure uh, enough marshes. We have a sprinkler and we also have ponds for the animals. We have a incubator facility that uh, we have established. And so our focal species for the last couple of years has been uh, the, the Manure emis, the largest tortoise of Asia. And so we have been uh, successfully breeding them for the last two years. So in 2019, we have got uh, 46 hatchlings and uh, 27 survived, 19 individuals died. Uh, and this year we got 56 hatchlings so far. And we're hoping uh, to get more individuals and we're hoping to increase the numbers in captivity. So we are planning for a, a pilot reintroduction of money rare emmys in next year. Uh, and as you can see, there's a picture on, on the bottom left that some of the individuals have in one year individual has uh, grown to over 300 grams and respecting those individuals who reach up to about uh, 500 to 600 grams. And uh, we have already been in dialogue with the local villagers on the uh, community managed forest around 200 acres, 200 hectares have agreed to uh, uh, have agreed to uh, release, uh, work with us and release uh, the, uh, the baby tortoise, the captive bred uh, tortoises. And uh, we are continuing, we're planning to continue support the communities and give them different livelihood options, such as uh, mixed orchard, which will uh, encourage them to reduce the dependency on the forest resources. And some of the villages already getting benefit from our school for conservation. So that's kind of motivating them and they see a sense of ownership. And we do plan to uh, reintroduce, uh, plan to uh, radio track them after release. And we believe that uh, the release program will uh, initiate a better rapport with the communities and other stakeholder. Because historically, uh, there are so many other captive breeding projects in Bangladesh, which initiate the captive breeding very successfully. However, they don't really, a lot of those programs fail to uh, reintroduce in the wild. So uh, captive breeding programs can often be seen negatively in this country. And as I see that we've taken the individuals back from the forest and putting them in a center. So, uh, so if we believe that if we release them, we can show some of the evidence of success, then that would ultimately gain support for bigger conservation of the species in, in the Bangladesh. So one of the second projects we have been working on is the Black Soft Shell. So we have a shrine in, uh, in Chittagong in the southeast of Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, uh, about a two acre pond, and that's probably the only non-captive uh, population of uh, Nilocenia nigricans of the Black Soft Shell in Bangladesh. And estimated about 200 to 400 individuals uh, living within the pond. Uh, and uh, there, there are some basic published studies on their uh, breathing biology, but still uh, not, we still don't know much about their ecology in the wild. So uh, the temple had a nesting area, but unfortunately, because of the in, uh, development of the structure, like the, con this, the mosque, the, uh, this co uh, concrete facility, like market around the pond, there haven't been much uh, uh, nesting areas available. So, uh, Currently, the temple had a very poor hatchling uh, recruitment and hatching success. So we started working, we visited the uh, pond last uh, two years ago, and uh, we discussed with the, uh, the shrine authority and uh, they asked for our help. And we have been working with the pond authority and helping them to increase the hatchling rec recruitment. Oops, I'm having difficulty going to the menu slide. So, all right, so, uh, so 
in last year in 2019 we hatched about 38 uh, black soft shell and this year we reached uh, about 150 hatchlings uh, we were targeting for like about 500 to 600 hatchlings but unfortunately due to COVID we had to restrict some of the field some of our field activities so however 150 hatchlings have been born this year and uh, that's helping us to really build a rapport with the, the Shrine Authority as well. And this year uh, we have established a uh, 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 hatchling pond. Uh, the goal is to uh, keep the hatchlings until they grow about uh, big enough so that uh, they can survive in the pond. But, but ultimately we do eventually planning for uh, the wild introduction of the species. And we have been on dialogue with the uh, Forest Department and the Shrine Authority uh, to establish uh, a second captive population of the species in different areas. And this is some of the pictures of uh, our incubator uh, facility in the Shrine. And that's uh, the beautiful hatchlings black soft shell. And here's a picture of uh, uh, we constructed this pond in this year and um, so about 20 by 25 feet pond where we are planning to keep the hatchlings. So uh, moving forward uh, we planning we're planning to initiate the introduction of uh, uh, Manuria emis uh, next year and that we'd be releasing them in one of the sites and hopefully in, uh, we'd be able to get more uh, individual adult of money remis and then we can they can contribute in the captive breeding population as well and we're also hoping for to initiate breeding of hisomis depressa and indotestuda longata in the next couple of years and we're also planning to expand our total conservation uh, center facility we plan to have a, a larger enclosure for a, a handling of and rehabilitation of rescued individuals of turtles and tortoises and we are also working to help establish a second uh, population of uh, black soft shell collaborating with uh, the shrine authority as well so so that uh, some of them some of the individuals can be uh, head started and can be hopefully released back in in, in the wetlands of bangladesh where they historically occurred and they're still found in in low density population in the northern part of Bangladesh. And so we, as I mentioned earlier, we have so much, we have so little information available on the turtles of Bangladesh. We also don't know uh, very little, we no, don't know much about the river turtles in Bangladesh, especially some of the species like Bartagur Kachuga, Bartagur Hangoka, and also Chitra Indica. Some of the species haven't, have been, been very rare so we are planning to conduct surveys of river turtles in the northern part of Bangladesh and also in the northeast part of Bangladesh in the wetlands. And we do believe uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, possibilities for transboundary cooperation with India and Myanmar program, especially for the introduction of Manria MS. Uh, so here are some acknowledgments. Um, we're grateful for our donors for supporting our project. And uh, so that was it. Thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. The first one we have is, um, get in front of me again. How are the turtles perceived by local populations? Are they including? view them as holy or dirty or as a food delicacy or taboo or are they hunted for export? Okay, uh, so for the first question, um, so uh, the turtles are uh, historically, uh, so the communities living in the area are, uh, are primarily subsistence uh, hunter. So they primarily hunt uh, turtles and tortoises for food. And uh, they usually uh, hunt turtles using their hunting dog. And usually those are opportunistic hunting. So, uh, and uh, usually uh, turtles uh, population have been declining because also of the destruction of the forest, but uh, there is no uh, a, a delicacy or food or any of the taboo. But uh, so, so far we haven't found any, uh, 
any evidence of commercial harvesting of turtles and tortoises in that area. But uh, the communities have been supportive of, of uh, our program and, and, and whenever they see particular, they see an incentive because for them turtles are food. So whenever they see uh, incentive, they're getting benefit from this project and that can motivate some of the communities for conservation. Or David. Uh, Steve, the second question, did you get that one? How can you ensure the sustainability of the parabiologist program? All right, so uh, yes, that's a very good question. So that's one of our, um, the biggest challenge that we have been facing. So uh, we uh, had uh, 10 parabiologists because of lack of funding in the recent years we have currently are employing five parabiologists and the more the better uh, because uh, the more funding we have the more parabiologists we can hire and um, so that it can ensure a larger you can uh, cover a larger area and uh, collect information mm -hmm. so um, uh, so currently we have been depending on on the grants and the donor funding so 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 far that's our the only way we have been mentioning our program but absolutely i've been looking for yeah. other ventures for example, our turtle conservation center can be a site for ecotourism, whether we can collect some revenue from the visiting school groups and uh, from other people, because it can provide them such a unique experience of uh, uh, for the, for the turtles and tortoises, like we've seen in other programs like the Galapagos tortoises. So that's one way you're planning to make our program a bit more sustainable. And also you're planning for a sponsor a parabiologist or adopt a turtle. That's something that we have been uh, planning to launch in the recent, in the near future. All right, so the third question, has there been genetic work done on the Bostami turtles? So uh, there has been some work done uh, by uh, Dr. Peter Prashag, but I think uh, one of the key questions we need to find out uh, to, to survey for the, the, the wild, the river turtles, in the, to find the wild population of uh, the uh, Bostami turtles in the river, but I think there is also opportunities for a lot of uh, genetic work as well. Is there any more question? I believe that is it, Caesar. Thank you. All right. Thank you, David. I'll log off.